the various levels of right view are assumptions we have to make, working hypotheses we have to hold to. If we want to follow a path that leads to true happiness. Someone asked me one time, how did the teachings on karma and rebirth make me happy? How did the teachings on spontaneously appearing beings make me happy? Well, it's not that the teachings themselves are supposed to make you glad. But when you take them as working hypothesis, you realize that they do open the way to the end of suffering, a path that you can follow to the end of suffering. But it's important that you understand what the Buddha meant by karma. One of the beliefs that's often attributed to him is that everything that happens is determined by the past. But he himself said that that kind of teaching leaves you bewildered. It means if you're someone who steals and has illicit sex and kills animals, it's, well, it's because of past karma. You're not responsible. So there's no idea of what should be done and what shouldn't be done. You have to realize that past karma leads to tendencies, opens possibilities, closes possibilities, depending on the karma. But it's not mechanical. And there's no tit for tat. That's another one of the teachings the Buddha said. If, say, you killed five people, then you'd have to be killed five times before you could get an awakening. He said nobody would ever get an awakening that way. But that's not how it works. Your actions from the past determine what kind of pleasures and pains you're going to be susceptible to, what openings there will be, as the, the Buddha's image is of a hand that does or does not have a wound. If the hand doesn't have a wound, it can hold poison, and the poison won't seep in. If it does have a wound, then if you ever decide to hold poison in that hand, then the poison can seep in. The wound stands for the possibilities. Your choice to hold or not to hold poison, that's something you do in the present moment. So just because you have some bad karma doesn't dictate precisely how it's going to work out. He says if you make karma of a certain kind, it will lead to a certain kind of result. But the strength of that result and the time at which it will appear depend a lot on your present karma. And this is why the teaching is one that gives you hope. The fact that we're born means that we're going to have to die, and there's going to be aging and illness in the meantime. But whether we're going to suffer from those things, that's optional, and that's what we can make a difference in. This is why we practice. This is why we train the mind. This is why training the mind involves sitting here with your eyes closed, watching the movements of the mind, so you can understand what you're doing, see what you're doing clearly. And if you see that you're making some unskillful choices, you can unmake them, because there is that element of free choice in the present moment. The alternatives it has to choose among may be limited by past karma. But there always is the choice to do something skillful. That option is always there. So what this means is you meet up with the results of some past bad karma. Suppose somebody does something bad to you. It doesn't mean that your past karma compelled them to do something bad. There's something that your past karma left the opening. They saw the opening and they took it. Now, of course, that becomes their karma. And the fact that you had that past bad karma, there are unskillful ways and skillful ways that you can think about it. The unskillful way would be to think, well, this person was simply carrying out the, the dictates of karma, so the person is not responsible or is actually doing something good. That's unskillful. It doesn't excuse that person's behavior. Because the person did choose to take that opening. The skillful way is to say, well, I must have some past bad karma. So learn how to take it in stride. Not get too worked up about it. And take it as an incentive to try to be more skillful in the future. As for times when someone does something really nice to you, 
Again, there are skillful and unskillful ways of thinking about the karma involved in that. The unskillful way would be to think, well, I deserve that good thing. That person has nothing to do with it. I don't have to be grateful to that person because, after all, it was my own karma that opened that possibility. But that's an unskillful way of thinking. The skillful way would be to think, okay, I have that past good karma, and here it's coming around. Now what am I going to do with it? I worked so hard to do that good deed in the past. Am I just going to sit here and enjoy the results? Or am I going to invest them further? Am I going to take advantage of the opportunity that this good fortune has brought my way? And that's for the person who chose to do something good for you. You have a sense of gratitude, because they were free to choose not to do that. That opening could have been just left there. Maybe someday something would have come in and filled it up. But that person chose to take advantage of the opening at that point. That was that person's goodness. This is why gratitude is real. Why gratitude is one of the things that the Buddha pointed out. When you understand karma from his point of view, gratitude makes sense. Generosity makes sense. So if you learn how to think about karma in the right way, you find that it is a good working hypothesis. Remember how the Buddha explained causality. Some causes give their effects immediately, other causes give them over time. Which means that what you're experiencing right now is a combination of things coming from the past and choices made in the present moment. And as the causal factors are ordered in dependent core rising, your present acts of attention and acts of intention actually come prior to your experience of whatever the results of past karma may be coming in. Intention and attention come under name and form. Then based on name and form, through the six senses, and through the six senses there's contact. And it's contact of the six senses, and your experience of the six senses, and we said that's should be seen as past karma. So you're, actually your present intentions come first. This too is an important principle. If there are no present intentions, then there'd be no experience of the results of past karma. This is why it is possible at the moment of the noble paths and the fruitions. When there is no experience of the six senses, it's because you've stopped having intentions right now. That's why there's an escape. And of course, you can't simply tell yourself, well, don't have any intentions, because that becomes an intention. This is why the path requires a skill. It requires actually many skills. As you get really good at bringing the mind to a state of equipoise here in the present moment, where you see everything that's going on in the mind really clearly. All the levels of intention begin to open up, and you see that if you act on any of them, either way, either staying or moving to something new, it's going to entail more stress, more impermanence, more inconstancy. And you look for an alternative. When the alternative opens up, that's where there's an experience of the deathless. So the way the Buddha explains karma and causality is precisely the explanation we need for there to be that possibility, the possibility to find an escape from karma. So it's in that way that the principle of karma should make you happy because it opens possibilities, good possibilities. Of course, it also means that you have to learn how to take the results of past bad actions with good grace. Realizing that it doesn't justify anybody who mistreats you, but it does mean that you learn to just take things in stride, 
and do your best with the good karma that comes your way. Again, grateful for the people who help you, and grateful to yourself for having done something good in the past that allowed that help to come your way. And part of that gratitude means you're not, you're not going to let the opportunity to go to waste. And John Lee has a nice comment. He says, think about the fact that you've got a human mouth. It took a lot to merit a human rebirth. We have a mouth that can say things, send messages. So bow down to your mouth. In other words, appreciate the fact that you worked hard to get this mouth. You worked hard to get this human breath. Put it to good use. Otherwise, all that work is going to go to waste. So when you think about karma in the right way, it really does make you happy. It does lift your spirits. That principle explains one of the strange passages in the canon. There's a sutta where King Ajata Sutta comes to see the, the Buddha. The Buddha gives him a really long, long, long Dharma talk. And Ajata Sadhu, who had, had his father killed, can think of only one thing. If only I hadn't killed my father. And so that's what he tells the Buddha at the end. After the Buddha's finished the talk, he says, he confesses the fact that he killed his father. He sees that it was a mistake. The Buddha says, it's a good thing you see it's a mistake, because that's how there's progress in the Dharma and the Vinaya, in the Vinaya of the Noble Ones. Chattha Siddhu leaves, and the Buddha says to the monks, you know, if he hadn't killed his father, he would have become a stream enterer, listening to that Dharma talk. But the fact that he killed his father has cut him off at the root. And then the Sutta ends by saying, gratified the monks delighted in the Buddha's words. It's not that they're delighting in Chattha Siddhu's bad fortune. And it's bad choices. But they're delighting in the fact that karma works, regardless of what power you have. And it may explain a lot of suffering, but it doesn't justify the suffering. It just simply says, this is why it's there. But the way karma works offers the way out. So even though we've done bad things in the past, we don't have to suffer for them. Think of that image of the salt crystal. You put it into a cup of water, and you can't drink it. You put it into a river of clean water, you can still drink the water because there's so much more water than there is salt. The water stands for the state of mind in the present moment. The salt stands for your past bad karma. How big the water of your mind is going to be is your choice right now. So take advantage of that, the freedom of choice that you've got.